Actually, let me, let me just see if the rest of it's fine. Let, let, let just leave it. So, it, well, this is, ah, there we go. <laughs> so, at SDSCI, we're supposed to make sure that the missions that we're associated with actually work for the user community. That's what we're supposed to do with JWST. That's what we try to do with HST at the moment. JWST is an incredibly complex machine. You shouldn't underestimate that. It's also been an extreme, it's probably the most expensive science project that's been done in the States, probably in international partnership too. So we really want to make sure we get the, the science out of it that we, we deserve to show to, the, to the, the taxpayers who have provided the funding. Um, in order to do that, it's important that the community gets up to speed as fast as possible in what JWST data look like. And that's why we're doing something called the Aerial Release Science Program, to get data out to the community as fast as possible. Uh, in terms of advice from the community so far, the main group that we've interacted with at a high level is the, is the JWST Advisory Committee. It's chaired by Garth Illingworth, who was one of the uh, involved in the uh, Kasani uh, Committee, which basically put JWST on track uh, for launch. It's good international representation. We're actually morphing at the moment towards more of a user committee. By this time next year, we should have a, user, a, a formal user committee in place that will deal with uh, items at a lower level. But that's, that, that committee, this committee has been very important in giving us advice on how to set high level priorities as we've gone through the mission. So the other thing I should say is looking within STSCI itself, the science policies group there within the science mission office, um, is responsible for implementing policies both for observing on HST and for JWST. I'm just listing the members there. Klaus Leitherer is the person who runs the HST TAC. Brett Blacker is a name feared throughout the world on Blacker Friday after the HST TAC process. Andy Fuchter, Janice Lee, Jen Lutz, uh, Amaya Mora Martin, and Lou Strolger, who is working on the call for proposals. So just give them credit for their work. What I'm going to talk about here, the science timeline. Um, when calls for proposal are happening, when deadlines are. Uh, talk about JWST and HST, because we're restructuring some of the HST TAC process to fit in with JWST. <clears throat> and then spend some time talking about um, our, the di director's discretionary aerial release science program, what the, the objectives are, what the priorities are. I will put in pictures of dogs on the way through to keep you amused and awake, and because I really like them, sometimes better than people. OK, so background. <clears throat> We've talked about science planning for quite a, quite a number of meetings now. I'm going to talk here about the timeline. If you go outside, poster 7 is talking about the early release science program. Poster 8 is talking about the JWC science timeline. Um, thanks to Maca for putting those up there. The, um, that gives you more details that you can look at. In terms of observing programs with JWST, there's the guest observer program. That will take about 80% about of the time through the first five cycles. Guaranteed observer programs. They're 4,000 hours, so that's about six months. Uh, it's allocated over the first 30 months, so that's the first three cycles. <clears throat> and there are some policy constraints in how that time is divided up. Then there's also director's discretionary time programs, up to 10%. And director's discretion, as with Hubble, the director's discretionary time is both going to be for rapid response observations, new things happen in the sky, but also for coherent programs, like the Frontiers Field Program at the moment, like the early release science program going forward. This is my first timeline, so this is just saying, uh, pointing out when things happen um, in terms of the GTOs submitting their proposals. Uh, somebody mentioned it's two years until launch. That's true. It's not two years until you need to start thinking seriously about what you're going to do with JWST. The call for the GTO proposals will go out in January. That's actually important for uh, uh, people beyond the GTOs. Proposals that are due in April, uh, April 1st. I like April 1st. Um, and then the observations will be published to the community, so everybody knows what the GTOs are going to observe by June the 15th. Uh, the GTO programs it says, have priority and specific observations of specific targets, and we'll make the full list available to the community so that you know what the GTOs have, have decided to observe. So why, so why is the GTO call of interest? Well, that's going to be the first time that we'll have something out there that details some of the policies that we're going to use for JWST. Duplication policy, uh, target, of, uh, target of opportunity policies, time control observations, change, uh, change program policies. Those are going to be linked in with the GTO call. So that's the, that's, that will be public and it'll be the first chance for everybody to see what we're talking about there. Why do we have this sort of one, uh, two month gap? One and a half months? Yeah, two and a half months between 
the proposals coming in and the publishing the observations, well, we need to resolve any potential duplications among the GTO proposals. I don't think there's going to be many. The GTOs are working well together as a team to craft their observing plans, but we need to make sure about that. <clears throat> and then also there is this requirement in here that NASA policy says that the cycle one GTO time must make up between 25% and 49% of the total time available in that cycle. That actually turns into a requirement that the GTOs must use about 2,000 hours, about half their time in cycle one. Um, that leaves a lot of time for the GOs. There's almost 5,500 hours uh, that will be available for GEO programs. That's about the same amount of time as you have in Hubble, if you allow for the fact that Hubble's got a typically 3,500 orbits of science time, and then you allow for the fact that a third of that is uh, not usable. So there's a lot of time in JWST cycle one for the general community. Okay, so the, the GEO cycle, uh, the call for proposals will go out on November 30th next year. The deadline will be in March. The TAC will meet in May of 2018. So that's the schedule that, you, so this time, this time next year, you should really have a good idea of what you want to do with JWST. In terms of the program types available for cycle one, and we will flesh out the details here, but you know, we'll, we'll, we're not that inventive when it comes to naming. There will be small, medium, large, and very large programs. It's likely in cycle one that we will not have a very large option. It's likely in cycle one we will focus more on setting the balance of time towards the smaller programs because JWC is an incredibly powerful instrument. It can do an awful lot with a small amount of time. So that's where the balance will be. We'll shift the balance towards larger programs uh, in later cycles. There will also be special categories, <clears throat> long-term programs, so monitoring, parallax, whatever. I guess with parallax you don't have to worry now. Gaia does all of it. Uh, target of opportunity programs, treasury legacy programs, these are larger scale programs that will um, have multiple science purposes and deliver data to the, the community. Um, we, we don't, and with Hubble, we have a number of joint programs with Chandra, with NOAO, with XMM. We don't, and actually NRAO, we will not have that in cycle one for JWST, but we will probably move to that uh, in later cycles. <clears throat> and I'll talk a bit about how HST and JWST might phase together. There will be coordinated science parallels available in cycle one, and I'll talk more about that on Wednesday. And then there will also be, uh, we'll accept proposals for, yeah, pure parallels will be available. We'll accept proposals for archival and, and theory research programs. Okay, our two telescopes, JWST and HST. <coughs> yeah, they're cute. Um, so this is the baseline schedule for proposing for HST. Typically, there's a deadline in April, the TAC meets in May. Now, you might notice something there in common. Actually, I guess it's in June. Uh, if you take this forward, for the cycle 26 deadline, we're talking about the community preparing HST cycle 26 proposals and JWST cycle one proposals at the same time, and our hosting two TACs at, uh, in Baltimore to deal with those proposals. That's not really sensible, either for you or for us. So what we're planning on doing is restructuring the HST cycle so that next year's TAC will actually pre-allocate some cycle 26 time. There'll probably be about 4,600 orbits available for allocation of the cycle 25 TAC. In, uh, <clears throat> so deadline, <clears throat> deadline of April 2017, the TAC will be in June. It's the second week in June of 2017. So we'll pre-allocate the time and we'll slide the cycle 26 tack later. And that's, that means that, that that tack will have less orbits to allocate. We'll restrict that to medium size and large programs, probably 1,200. We'll also have a number, you know that we now have a mid-cycle opportunity uh, for HST, where if there's some, a new discovery that comes up, you can put in a proposal during the cycle. The deadline for that actually, is the next one coming up is September 30th, <clears throat> limited to small orbits. So this is the scheme that we've come up with to accommodate the fact that we're running the two tacks together. And this is the revised timeline. So in, in this case, you've got the cycle 26 deadline will be in July. The cycle 26 tack will meet in September. That means that by that point, you know what has been allocated time for JWST cycle one. You can propose for HST supporting follow-up observations. And then as I say, the mid-cycle, this is actually, we'll probably just go for one mid-cycle in cycle 26 probably around about uh, February. So there'll be an opportunity to put in small programs as well. But that's the way that the synergy between HST and JWST will work in that cycle. And that's the way we're moving things to try and accommodate the two large programs. So data access. <clears throat> 
JWC, is, as, as uh, Jeff said, JWC is going to start science observations in April 2019. The cycle two call for proposals is going to come out only five months after that. The cycle two deadline is going to be in December, so that's only seven months after the start of observations. With most data on JWST being proprietary, that's only going to give a limited number of the community access to data, real data from JWST, unless we do something about it, unless we give broader community access. Even if you have time on JWST, if your observations are scheduled in November, you're not going to learn much if the deadline is December. So this is something that the uh, JSTAC pointed out early on, that really we need to think about some kind of early release, well, they called it a, kind of a quick look program, looking back at the Spitzer side, um, a set of suite of programs that would demonstrate key modes of the JWC instruments, and the goal of this program is to enable the community to understand the performance of JWC prior to the submission of the first post-launch cycle two proposals. So what we come up with is a concept of a suite of science demonstration observing programs that are designed by the community. Designed by the community because we want, we, these programs need to cover the full range of science that JWST can do. It's not something that you could take, particularly it's not something you could take the STSCI staff and say design the programs. It's not something you want a small committee to design. This is across the board from observations of Jupiter to the highest redshift galaxies and everything in between. Uh, they'll be supported with director's discretionary time. That means the data have no exclusive access period, and the programs will be selected prior to the cycle one geo call. Um, and then this is, well, this is just quoting Lincoln, but never mind. Lincoln would have said there was a, uh, the DDRS ERS program represents science from the community, selected by the community, for the community. Seven score five years ago. Never mind. So what, what's the difference between an ERS proposal and a cycle one geo proposal? It has to do with helping the community, I think. When you take in a standard proposal to a standard TAC, you ask the TAC members to focus on the science. What's the most compelling science in their mind? In the case of the DDRE ERS programs, you're preparing the community to maximize JWST scientific productivity. So you want reviewers to select the program based not just, I mean, the science obviously has to merit use on JWST, but you also want the reviewers to think about how does this help this particular set of the community for exoplanets? Does, does the average exoplanet observer, is that person going to learn from this program useful information to propose for cycle two? So that's a different dimension in there. And there's, like I say, there's the altruistic element. Uh, how will you help your colleagues exploit JWST? Some of you may recognize this. I think there's a quote that goes with it. Ask not what JWST can do for you. Ask what you can do for JWST. It goes down better in the US. So I, so I call it, this is Smiling Ken, our director. Um, he's allocated 500 hours of director's discretionary time for early release science. Um, th that will go towards supporting up to about 15 teams. The proposals are going to, uh, will be selected to cover research areas spanning the science themes of JWST, which basically means almost all science. And then they'll be reviewed, there will be peer review. So there will be a TAC effectively that reviews those proposals and then gives a recommendation to Ken as to which ones he should implement using his director's time. And Ken obviously has the final say in this because it's his time. So how do you distinguish these programs from standard geo programs? Well, again, it's, it's, you, you want to help the community learn how to exploit the science capabilities of JWST. So they're, they're substantive. These aren't just looking at one object for an hour and a half. These are substantive programs that are going to uh, provide a solid a grasp on what uh, JWST can do within a particular science area. They need to be supported by, you, you, they should represent the community's uh, desires within a particular field. So you want to pull a lot of community members and setting them up. Um, and then you want those programs to go through and design science enabling products at the end that will go out to the community and help them better understand how to use JWS in the future. So you're talking about involving a large number of people here. You're talking about a, a small core team who are going to be responsible for the timely display delivery of such products. That looks like a contradiction, but one might think about this in terms of collaborators and co-investigators, but there needs to be an effective delivery of results to the community. The observations also need to be, you need to have targets that you can do, observe within the first few months. There's no point in having an early science program if you can't observe that target until December. And then 
like it says at the end, the RON and the public data will become available immediately to the community. So I think a good way of thinking about these programs is that they're Pathfinder programs. That's a good American word. Um, but basically, this is helping the community understand more about how, JW, how JWST works and what its capabilities are. Because this is going to be a complex instrument with IFUs, with multi-slit um, spectrographs, um, and, and with coronagraphs. So what's the timeline? Well, this is the timeline I've talked about so far. This is what we envisaged for the, this is what we will have for the early science timeline. So around about the same time as the GTO call goes out, we'll put out uh, an, the initial call for proposals that will actually call for submission of uh, notices of intent. The notices of intent will be due in March of next year. Final CP will come out in May, and then the proposals will be due in August. So that's after the GTO observations have been finalized and released. And then the TAC will happen in, uh, sometime in October next year. The notices of intent are mandatory. If you're intending to submit an ERAS proposal, you need to sub submit a, mo a notice of intent. That's for a couple, <clears throat> a couple of reasons. One of them is simply to understand who's doing what so that we can put together a TAC that is as unconflicted as possible in reviewing those proposals. And this is what, <clears throat> this is what the, um, the NOI will, uh, uh, will cover. It'll be a project title, a brief description of the science, PI, co-I's, uh, and possibly co-PI's, number of co-I's, possibly number of collaborators as well, then a description of how the proposing team represents the relevant experts and demographics of the sub-discipline. All of this will remain confidential within SDSCI. As I say, it's to give us an understanding of what does the community want to do. The proposal itself, this, will be, this is somewhat revi revised in format relative to the standard pro observing proposal. Uh, you have to justify, why, why, why should we give you early release science time? What good is it to the community that you should do this program? Um, how are you going to manage the program? Um, the scientific justification, why does this merit JWST time? Then the observations, and then some description of, the, um, of how the proposing team was put together. And the selection criteria are also somewhat different than your standard science proposal. Again, there's going to be a focus on how is this good for the community? Um, what's the value of the proposed science enabling products? Do you have a good work plan? Then the scientific merit and the technical merit feasibility for execution and so on. Um, one of the things that always comes up is that we're, we're talking about giving back to the community. Clearly, you're not going to be able to prov provide fully polished science products within the five or six month time frame. In fact, almost everybody, I think, in cycle one is going to be working from ground-based calibration data. So there's always going to be improvements there. So we, we see this as coming in a, a staged uh, delivery back from these ERS teams. One of the first things that we we'll want them to do is that we'll have a series of meetings, of briefings, where they will be tasked with explaining yeah, what issue, I'm, I'm almost there. Um, what issues have they encountered in terms of setting up this program? Um, to give the community an idea of, of, of issues that they've hit in trying to get the program on, on the telescope, dealing with the uh, results afterwards. I'd expect that they would produce, produce some software documentation so that they will explain how things, um, what issues, what they saw from the user's perspective. And then there will be enhanced data products, but those I would see as coming in a phased manner. So. This then is the overall goal. And I think, um, so this is kind of the mode that we have at the moment, where everything is focused within SDSCI in terms of supporting the community. Our goal is to move to something like this, where you'll distribute the expertise beyond. So there are some nodal, obviously we still have the main responsibility for ensuring that JWST works, but you started to put out more expertise in the community, so you can get this knowledge diffusing much faster through the community. So once again, this is the timeline. I just mentioned that uh, in October, we're expecting to put out a special issue of the newsletter from SDSCI that will have much more detail about the proposal preparations and other information. And then this is the summary. So science, the science planning timeline, we've, we've, we're basically nailing things down in terms of actual days now. We've got a framework for the DD early release science program, 12 to 15 science programs with 500 hours of DD. Then the goal is preparing the community to maximize data receive science productivity in cycle two and beyond. And then finally, the HST proposal timeline is restructured to support and complement JWST cycle one. And I will just leave you with uh, a multicolor timeline. So thank you. <clears throat> Sure, 
Yep. So the question was the, the ERS program, <coughs> program need to deliver products. We'll set up that timeline. Sorry, I've got several frogs in my throat. <coughs> um, We'll work on that with the individual programs. Yeah, we'll, we're, we don't have a kind of uh, what a cookie cutter timeline for everything. We want to have some kind of data product delivered, say two or three. I mean, it all depends on when things schedule. But uh, say a month or two before the the call for proposals got, get, gets out, we want to have some kind of delivery. But it's probably going to be a very intermediate state, and any kind of final del uh, delivery would come after that. So uh, we'd work on something that that, that made sense based on what's happening on the telescope or what information is available, so by project. So the question is, how does that relate to when the data becomes publicly available? The data become publicly available immediately, instantly. instantly. Yeah, they just go into the archive and they, are, they have no proprietary time, so anyone can get to them as soon as they're taken. Yes? So the question was about participation in the ERS teams and whether there was anything that uh, prevents GTO members from participating as team members. Simple answer is no. And clearly, we, we don't want to set this up so that uh, anyone has, has to collaborate with either a GTO member or an SDSCI staff member. But um, it's obviously that's where a lot of the expertise rests. And I think, uh, you know, so yes. But Neil, this raises a general issue. You could end up, I mean, to be parochial, you could end up having a foreign team that has nothing to do with the NearSpec team wanting to do MOS before we do MOS. And I wish you luck. OK? I, 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 I accept your point, yes. I, but I think the, 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 TAC, the TAC is going to look at this. One of, the, one of the things they're going to look at is the work plan. Is it credible? So I mean, they're going to look at that. Yeah. OK. And remember, the director is the, the ultimate person that selects. I think you have to allow for a degree of sensibility <laughs> in the selection. Taken. Roberto? When the GTO teams will have their time expired, and can they protect a certain target for multiple cycles? Uh, the question was about the GTO teams when their time expires and whether they can protect the target. So. The GTOs have 4,000 hours spread over the first three cycles, not only the first 30 months, which basically means the first three cycles. In terms of protecting a target, I think that's unlikely. Um, the, the only, you know, once you've said you're going to observe a set of, uh, it's, it's, it, is, it will be difficult to change observations uh, that you propose for cycle one without a valid reason. I mean, the only way I could think of protecting a target would be to put it in there, then take it out, and put it in there and take it out. And that's, I, I don't think the GTOs are but going to do But what happens in cycle two, when we next June submit our target right. list? So the, way the, so the cycle, so the, the cycle one GTO targets, the observations are protected, again, are, uh, you need to have a scientific justification for repeat observations. Same for the DDERS, same for the cycle one GTO. A cycle, a cycle two GTO, will, uh, that target list goes in, I think, in April, or actually it's only about one month after the cycle one observations start. And that cannot duplicate previous observations. But also GOs. But also GOs, yes. So, right. so when we, our first guarantee, list yes. does not carry over to cycle two. We start from scratch. Exactly. Okay. Yes. I mean, I, I That's actually, what you were hinting at, I yeah. presume, Roberto. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's, it's a big sky. There's an awful lot of targets. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one UDF. Yeah, you know. Well, fortunately, I don't work in extra galactic astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> How long after the observation stay, will the data stay uh, protected? Uh, for the current, it's currently a 12-month proprietary period for uh, anything that's not DD time. For the large programs, it's likely to be zero proprietary time. 